Good evening, everyone. Thanks for the songs, Bob. They were good. You know, when I was a kid, uh, all the way through elementary, middle school, and high school, when I was uh, uh, in school, I was horrible at English. I just, the, the class, the, I could never do well in the class. And I know we've got some, some teachers here, and I'm sure we've got some English teachers or former teachers, and no disrespect to you all, but I hated English. You know, they always say you're either an English and uh, history person or a math and science person, and I was the math or science person. I, English for me, it just never came easy. When it came to choosing whether to use good or well in a sentence, I, I always got it confused. Uh, you know, whether something was a noun, verb, adverb, adjective, direct object, preposition, I, I just never clicked. Or uh, if anyone ever did Shirley English growing up, uh, that, that to me just, it never, you know, clicked for me. And whether to use a semicolon, a comma, to start a new sentence, run on sentences. And I, I don't even get the, the whole there. You know, when you say their car is over there and they're over there, that to me, it just, yeah, it completely, it, it frustrates, and it still frustrates me today. If I ever type anything, I always have to have Jessica read it for me because she is the English person. Uh, you know, she proofreads everything. Um... But one thing that did kind of help me in kind of my English uh, troubles was when I was at Oklahoma Christian, uh, for my Bible degree, I had to take two years of Greek, or uh, four semesters of Greek. And they, they actually say taking uh, a foreign language, and especially Greek, uh, helps your English, because you kind of have to relearn some of the rules that you were supposed to learn when you were a kid. And... Uh, and so if, if you're having trouble with your English, I encourage you, go take Greek. Uh, it'll, it'll take care of all that. Uh, but that leads us to what we're actually going to be talking about tonight. Uh, if you saw tonight's sermon title, it's the perfect tense. And that doesn't mean like the ultimate or best tense, but there's actually in Greek a tense and it's called the perfect tense. Like how we have a verb tense, we say something happened in either the past, present, or future and then that influences the verb. In Greek, there's this thing called the perfect tense. And so tonight, we're going to talk about the perfect tense. We're going to look at uh, some texts that, where the perfect tense is seen. And then we're also going to kind of talk about what that means theologically. So I know, I know you're like on the edge of your seat, ready to get started. You know, that, that to you just sounds like so much fun. So uh, I won't delay us any longer. But before we get go any further, I do want just one. Can you tell them you're going to... I'm married to a lawyer, so I got to put in a disclaimer. Uh, I am, <laughs> I'm no English, or no Greek scholar, Greek professor. This, uh, my intended goal tonight is to share with you some things that I found in my own study to benefit you all so that we can grow together through this. And so please don't leave thinking, uh, I'm a Greek scholar by any means. This is just stuff that I've come across uh, on my own study. But simply put, the perfect tense indicates a completed action whose effects are felt in the speaker's present. And so let me read that again. A completed action, so something who, that happened in the past and whose effects are felt in the speaker's present. And so the action, like I said, normally occurs in the past, but it's still influencing the present, or it's influencing the speakers right now. And so to show it in English, uh, you could say, I wrote this letter. Now that would be an example of non-perfect tense. Because you wrote the letter, it's done. You've checked it off the list, there's nothing more to do with that letter. You wrote it, it's done. I have no more need of it. But if I were to say, I wrote this letter so that you will know I'm thinking about you, that's now kind of what the perfect tense is like. I wrote the letter in the past, I wrote it, so that right now you will know that I'm thinking about you. 
And so that's kind of this perfect tense. It's written in the past, something, a completed action whose effects are felt in the present. And so I wrote the letter in the past, but its effects, its purpose, is being, uh, is taking place now. Or uh, I've written this list so that I can go to the store. And so it's a completed action whose effects are felt in the speaker's present. And so in the Bible, we see, we have a lot of theological ideas or kind of some of our theology can come from this tense because it talks about something that was brought to completion in the past, but is, in still, inf- is still influencing the present and will influence all of the presents to come. So it influences the present of our children, of our grandchildren, our great grand, and so on and so on. And so it's something that happened in the past, but influences all of these futures and presents that will take place. Now with translating uh, the Greek perfect tense, there are some complications that kind of arise because you're talking about something in the past, but it's also kind of happening in the future. And so when you translate it, do you make it the past or do you make it the present? And the answer is yes, it can be both. And we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit here in a sec. But one of the most powerful, probably biggest foundations of our theology is found in John chapter 9 with the death of Jesus. So if you want to turn in John chapter 9, that's where we'll begin. Or sorry, John chapter 19, not 9. John 19, verse 28, and we'll read uh, 28, 29, and 30. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture will be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, the word for it is finished, it's a verb that is in this perfect tense that we're talking about. And, and the word or the, there in Greek, it could also be translated to it, it's brought to completion or uh, it's brought to perfection. And so it's this idea that it, it, it's run its course. It's done what it is meant to do. There's nothing more to be done. And so it was a task that's been checked off the list. But remember, it's not solely, in the perfect tense, it's not solely talking about a past tense, or it's not solely talking about something that's done and is never to be used again. It's an action that's been completed, but the effects are felt in the present, and also in this sense, they are felt and will be felt in the future. And Paul actually expands on this idea and how it is finished actually is in the perfect tense in Romans chapter 5. So uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Romans 5, we're going to see kind of how Paul expands on how this is a completed action, but its effects are felt in the speaker's present and in our present as well. Romans chapter 5 verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So here Paul is showing how Jesus' life and death is part of this perfect tense, this idea of having an impact in the present. And so Christ died on the cross He said, it is finished, but that's not really the final end. Because what I, he's saying, what I've done here on earth, my my death right here on the cross is going to continue well into the future. 
In fact, it's going to bring salvation for all people. And then Paul comes along and explains this further with what we just read. That Christ died for us while we were still sinners. While we were in our sinful state, Christ died for us. Before we were even born, Christ died for us. And because of that, we have now been saved and have now been reconciled back to God. Jesus came. It was finished. His task was done. But the effects of that task are still being felt well into the future today in our own present. And so it's that completion that brings the effects. The effect is our salvation, the world's salvation. And in fact, verse 9, uh, it reads, Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? The verb for saved right there is also in the perfect tense. Again, it's this idea that Christ, through Christ, we have been saved. But it doesn't stop there. You know, uh, we're continually saved. We can't do anything that separates us from the love of God. The, the salvation, reconciliation, and forgiveness, it's, it's a continual thing. Its effects are felt throughout. It's a past thing where the effects are felt in the speaker's present. So we become a Christian, we receive salvation and God's grace, and forgiveness continues to be with all of us. It's something that happened in the past and has an effect for the present. Now, if we go to Exodus 15, we'll see the perfect tense played out in another way. And so we're going to see something kind of interesting in Exodus 15, if you want to turn there. And so we've got Exodus 15, a little uh, background and refresher, I guess. You know, in Exodus, God calls Moses and uh, the Israelites at the time are slaves in Egypt, slaves to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. God calls Moses and tells him he's going to lead the people out of Egypt and uh, lead them to the promised land. And so they uh, go to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh says, no, he won't let the people go. And so God performs the ten plagues. After the tenth plague, Pharaoh decides to let them leave. While they are leaving, Pharaoh changes his mind, goes after the uh, twelve tribes of Israel, and they come to the sea, and uh, God parts the sea for his people and closes it up over Pharaoh and his army. And then the people see this power of God. They see the power that God has shown, and they put their trust in God. And so all of that happens, and then we come to chapter 15, and we have this, uh, if you have the chapter ID, it's the Song of Moses and Miriam. And so we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 18, and then we'll uh, go back and look at it. Starting in verse 1 of Exodus 15, Then Moses and the Israelites sang the song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils, I will gorge, them, gorge myself on them. And I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretch out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. 
By the power of your arm they will be as still as a stone until your people pass by, Lord, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. The Lord reigns forever and ever. Now, I read from the NIV. And if, so if you read from the NIV, you probably didn't notice anything. But if you read from the New American Standard or some other version, you probably noticed a difference. And not just word choice. It's actually... There's a difference in tense in some parts. Now, people always ask me, and you know, we always discuss a lot, you know, what is the best translation to use? And, and my first thing, I always say, whenever someone asks, what's the best translation? Or what translation do you recommend? I always say, the translation you read, you will read and understand is the best translation. Because if it does not serve those two purposes, if you don't read it and don't understand it, it's pointless. And then my second choice, my second thing I always say, is to read from multiple translations. And it's because of moments like this in Exodus 15 that you get more of that personal study. You can get more out of it. And so chapter 15 is divided, uh, verses 1 through 18 that we just read, the song is divided kind of into two sections. Verses 1 through 12 talk about things that have happened in the past. The crossing of the sea for instance. This is after the sea, and it kind of talks about it as if they've crossed it already. And then verses 13 through 18, things that will happen in the future. For example, receiving of the promised land. They haven't uh, conquered the people of the promised land. They haven't taken it over. But it's this idea that that's happening in the future. But I want us to look at some of the differences here. Verse 6 in the NIV says, Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. Talking about his power over Pharaoh. Verse 6 in the New American Standard says, Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. NIV says, was majestic. New American Standard says, is majestic. NIV said, shattered the enemy. New American Standard says shatters the enemy. And the question becomes, well, which is it? Is it past or present? Well, I say both. Because it's talking about, like what we said earlier with, new, with the perfect tense, it's a past event, something that happened in the past, but effects are still felt in the future. Let's look at one more example, and then we'll kind of tie it all together. Uh, New, NIV verses 13 through 15, uh, Exodus 15, it says, In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Now, if we look at New American Standard, verses 13 through 15, it says, In your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. The people as have heard, they tremble. Anguish has gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab, trembling, grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Remember, 13 through 18 is talking about the future, that God is going to give them the land of Canaan. So in the NIV, we have lots of wills, because it's looking to the future. It hasn't happened yet, technically. But in verse 13 through 15 of New American Standard, it's all past tense, as if it's already happened. But we know technically in the timeline, they haven't received the promised land. They've still got 40, they'll still have 40 years of wandering before they get to the land. So why the difference? Well, like I said, it's all about the perfect tense. Neither is wrong or more correct than the other. But what does this mean? So what we're seeing is that verses 13 through 18 haven't happened, but because of God's past actions, because God has been with them in the past, 
the future actions are guaranteed to happen. And in fact, they're so guaranteed to take place, it's as if they've already happened. And so it hasn't happened in how we view time, perhaps, but because God keeps his promises, it will happen, and it's almost this idea of you can bank on it. And we see the same idea in Joshua chapter 21. Joshua 21, verse 43. So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they possessed it and lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And no one of all their enemies stood before them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. Here the text tells us that God gave all the land that he had promised the forefathers of Israel. Back in Exodus 15, when Moses and all of Israel is singing this song in the perfect tense that talks about God giving them the land and it being a guarantee that he will give them the land. They're saying, you know, you're going to give us the land and, it, you know, it's such a guarantee we, you've already signed off on it. We pretty much already own the land. And then we come to Joshua 21, 45, and we find that it did come true, just as God had said. And this theme of, of God's word and promises being reliable is actually an extremely common theme we see all throughout the Bible, and especially in the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 119 Verse 140, your promises have been thoroughly tested and your servant loves them. Some translations say word instead of promises, but it's all the same thing that we're talking about. God's word, his, his promises are guaranteed. Psalm 145, verse 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. I mean, these are just two that are found in Psalms. But you, you know, go home. Uh, if you have a concordance or uh, you can go uh, online and find a concordance, you know, just look up promises and just see how many promises uh, are fulfilled in the Bible and just how many times it says, uh, talks about God's promises being fulfilled or coming true. You know, God keeps his promises. And so what does that mean for us? You know, how does that influence our life? Well, by looking at this perfect tense, we see this idea confirmed that God is a God who keeps his word. He's a God of his word. He keeps his promises. The things God says he'll do are so guaranteed to happen, we can live as if they've already happened. We can place our confidence in God that his word is true and what he says will happen. And that confidence can influence our lives then. And so when we look at John 14, verse 2, and Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. We can live with confidence that God's promises are a guarantee that we have a home in heaven. And that can then influence how we live here on earth. Or when we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, we can have confidence in the fact that we are now members of God's household. We are not excluded from the kingdom. We're no longer separated from God because God's word is true. We can have confidence in that. And finally, we can know that in the future, God is going to return. There will be a judgment and those of us who have been servants of him will go and be with him in heaven. Just as 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5 talks about. And so we can know all of this. We can know all of this to be true. We can live with confidence because God is a God that speaks truth and who keeps his promises. Let's pray. God, we come before you now and we just thank you that you are a God, an all-knowing God, Father. 
we thank you that, Father, uh, time for you is, is not in the sense that we think of in a timeline, but, Father, instead, time for you, the future is already guaranteed with you, Father, that we can rely on you. Father, we know that we can put our trust and confidence in you, and, Father, I pray that we will let that influence our lives. I pray that we will uh, be a people that, that puts our life and our trust and our confidence in you, Father, that we will live that way, Father, that this week we can, we can place our confidence in you and let that influence our lives. Father, I pray that we will seek you in all that we do, that we will be a people that gives glory and honor to your name. In your son's name we pray, amen.